everybody. This is John Yeager, another episode of Think Business. Welcome to the show and our guest today, I'm excited to have Elliot Holland. Um, Elliot, uh, we met on a, on a webcast within our firm um, and I found you be very passionate and energetic about what you do. So I was excited that you agreed to be on the show. So I'm gonna let you introduce yourself and tell us about what you do. Yeah, absolutely. Good to be here. So my name is Elliot Holland. And I, I run a firm called Guardian Due Diligence. And our principal duty is sort of helping business buyers, um, mid-career business buyers, acquisition entrepreneurs, uh, people who are buying themselves a company in the industry they work in, et cetera, helping them vet the companies that they're looking to acquire to be sure the financials and the operations are indeed what they're presented with. So we, we do quality of earnings, we do cash proofs, we do sort of financial due diligence packages. We help folks through negotiations and route to getting transactions done and sort of both coach people through the process and sort of help vet the target um, when people are looking to buy a company. And I'm talking companies sort of one to $15 million is where we spend most of our time. And are you helping them find the funding or have they already found it and you're just helping them through the due diligence process? How, how does that work? Most of our clients have found the funding already, although we do help with finding it. Um, we, in general, have sort of a full suite of buy side deal services. Um, so we can help put together like um, confidential information memorandums or memorandums to potential equity investors, debt investors. We do research reports to help people understand certain industries and, and a lot of other things that are sort of related to getting transactions done. So we, we can do all of those things as well. Awesome. So I've got um, a little bit of uh, background in the investment business, um, but I was smart enough not to be on the investment side. Um, I was smart enough to know I wasn't smart enough to be on the investment side, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but I always enjoy talking about it. Um, so where I want to start is I'd love to kind of hear your view of the current market. You know, what are you seeing out there in your, in your space? You know, that one to $15 million company and, and where are the deals coming from and what you see, you know, kind of what's going on out there? Sure, absolutely. So what I'm seeing is a lot of companies that were impacted by COVID and they're trying to figure out what their steady state operation will look like. And so they're thinking about um, sort of what is, they have, they have an EBITDA plus COVID, uh, EBITDAC. Uh, but more importantly, I think a lot of buyers are looking at what was sort of a one-time blip and, and whatever kind of return to normalcy has occurred, how much of it sort of has already pushed itself through the companies. I think whatever sort of retail downsized market shift that we were dealing with was definitely pushed forward. And so companies in those industries are trying to figure out what to do. And then some industries are even more attractive now because they weren't impacted or were positively impacted during COVID. Well, what is that, Elliot? Well, think about if you were um, collecting trash and getting paid per unit volume of last year, right? Um, or you were doing any sort of house services and people were at home the whole time. If you could get into the house, um, then you, were, you, you probably did a lot of business. And so there's opportunities around companies that did well. And then there's a bit more complex figuring when it comes to companies that may have had a little bit of a blip. So that was an interesting comment you made about EBITDA. Um, uh, so uh, tell me a little bit about that. I, you know, I, I certainly know that there were blips in performance and you have to take out one-time hits to earnings or one-time increases to earnings, you know, whatever it mm -hmm. might be, depending on what they're doing. But um, I'm a little bit curious about that and, and kind of how, you're, how you guys kind of view that and, and what kind of analysis you do around that and, and how that plays into the valuation side. Sure. So EBITDA is a proxy for cash flow. So the reason everybody looks at EBITDA is because it's the closest proximity to cash flow that shows up on the statement everybody looks at, which is the income statement. So EBITDA is adding a COVID adjustment to this cash flow proxy. So it's sort of like saying, let's just call 2020 an oops year. And let's say that the, the business would have operated at regular what is the effective EBITDA um, before you had to adjust for COVID in this business? So say business was down 
you know, 10% revenue, which could be 20% EBITDA. Well, that was an off year, they'll be coming back. So now that's adjusted back as if it was down 0% and then get a multiple off of that. And so the reason I bring it up is that as a buyer, you're gonna hear EBITDA and people try to sell their businesses off of this. And as a buyer, you have to be wise enough to recognize that some of the changes that happened during COVID aren't gonna come back to normal in the same way. And so that adjustment isn't appropriate. Gotcha. Makes makes perfect sense. I just haven't heard that explained before. So I appreciate that. So then we talk about the opportunities and the and evaluation and how you go, you know, kind of choosing, you know, how, who to work with and, and talking about their opportunities. And and obviously you're working with the you're working with the sellers a lot. Um, and so I'm sure the sellers um, make lots of good decisions and then maybe they don't make such good decisions on certain things. Right. How, what do you see are kind of the maybe top two or three, you know, good, bad, and ugly aspects of the of the process? Well, I would say good is when, well, let me take a step back. The, the textbook, if I was talking to my dad, my best friend, and they had a business and they were 10 years from selling, I would tell them that five years before they want to sell, they need to set a hard deadline that that's the when they potentially will want to sell to go to someone that advises people on M&A transactions and to not worry so much about what their business is or isn't, but recognize it to a buyer, it looks a certain way and to put their business into a format that's digestible by a buyer um, that maximizes the return, which typically means minimizing the risk for a new buyer so that you can achieve maximum price. And that process can take a year to three or four to execute. Gosh, that's a long time, Elliot. Well, here's why. As a buyer, I'm looking at the last 12 months to last 18 months of business operation. And so if you make a change six months before you're selling, there's actually not gonna be a full calendar year of seeing that change. And so when I'm applying a multiple, which is how I value businesses on a trailing 12 months EBITDA, if you only made the adjustment six months ago, it took three months to actually achieve any benefit then three months out of 12 have this new benefit, you haven't gotten the full benefit of the work that you've done. Additionally, some changes take two, three years. What are you talking about? Well, if part of the issue is removing the owner operator as the sole manager of the business and finding, cultivating, putting in place a very strong lieutenant who can do as much of that themselves, that may take 18 months to find, train, get that person ready, and then a year to have them actually do the things that they need to do to, to show a buyer that, that that lieutenant person is actually there and ready. And so when people say, oh, I want to sell next year, it's too late. Now, you can still sell your business, but when you're talking about some cosmetic things you can do to maximize value, you've lost a lot of the levers. So that's what I would tell sellers. I would also say buyers, the majority of buyers look at businesses as a multiple of cash flow. Sellers look at their businesses as 20 years of history, blood, sweat, and tears, almost missing payroll, getting through 08, 09. And that's fine, but you have to recognize when you're selling your business, the person who brings the money back is gonna set the valuation. And so you really have to be laser focused on getting to a sort of trailing 12 month EBITDA number that somebody can then apply a multiple to, which is how people value businesses to get your maximum valuation. So are you saying emotion doesn't play a factor in multiples? <laughs> For the most part, in the way that, that sellers sometimes speak on it. You know, John, you bring up a great point. So. If you spend the time five years early getting your business into order, then the emotion plays for you because the buyer will be so excited, their emotional response may influence them to overpay for the business. If you don't get your business in order, um, the buyer will not likely have an emotional response to putting a deflated multiple on your EBITDA to value your business. So, in this case, 
buyers are pretty prudent. So getting your house in order is, is a huge part of it because yeah, buyers will listen to the 20 years, will listen to um, getting through bad times, will understand to an extent the payroll stuff, but we're gonna say EBITDA times a multiple equals price. The old, the old saying, facts don't have feelings, right? <laughs> right. And, and once I show up, you can't change the EBITDA, right? Um, can't change the management team. Yeah. N numbers don't have feelings. I like that. So uh, it sounds like obviously the, the biggest uh, issue you run into when dealing with sellers is, is that they don't, they haven't planned far enough in advance uh, to do all the things they need to do to make the business the best, to be shown in the best possible light. Yes. I find that that's one of the bigger issues. You get a lot of people that within the year they want to sell it, raise their hand and go get uh, a broker or an investment banker. And you can see in the financials it's too late. Um, and then oftentimes the sellers don't have, they haven't done their research on what the selling your business process entails because it's a, it's a humbling process for a person who's, who's run a business themselves. Absolutely. It's your baby. And sometimes people tell you your baby's ugly, right? That's right. And that's where the emotional piece can get into the way of the seller. And the person who's willing to pay the most may have the most critiques of your baby. And so turning your emotional response off to get paid can be challenging. Or I think, you know, I have a concept of sort of putting a free man or a free woman into a cage as an owner, as a seller, you've been in the driver's seat, you've done what you've wanted, you created this freedom for yourself. But to sell this freedom at a multiple of cash flow, you now have to have to go through the critique of some brand new person that may or may not, in your opinion, deserve the ability to critique your business. But when they're bringing Brinks trucks, you have to sort of consider that. Absolutely. Anything else um, that you could think of that uh, obviously they need to engage early, uh, sellers need to engage early, a um, um, couple, three years in advance to get some of the things, anything else that you see that, um, you know, from a good, bad and ugly standpoint uh, that you would give advice to the, to, the, to the sellers with? Good is lots of data, um, standardized or documented processes systems that show and, and communicate how people can sort of take them on without you being there. Good. Bad is customer concentration, supplier concentration, um, things of that nature. Ugly, there's no management team in it. And so the business really is, you know, John Yeager and friends um, or Elliot Holland and friends. Um, um, ugly is a, a business where you waited until the last second for the industry to have value and then tried to sell it. So you don't want to be the last person holding on to a retail store or the last person holding on to a yellow pages manufacturing business. Absolutely. So then once you've got the seller through the process and now they obviously, um, uh, uh, well, uh, and, and so the buyer's taken over now. So you're, you're working with a buyer and, and uh, they're looking for a business to own some things that, you know, first to talk about what, what they should be looking at. And then secondly, once they buy the business, you know, is it like the dog chasing the car? You know, you catch the car. Now, what do you do with it? What, what do you, what do you, what do you talk to the buyers? What do you talk to the buyers about? Once they become Those owner? are two great questions. Let me make sure I, I park the second one so I can come back to it. In terms of buyers where they need to do the work, and this is the challenge. So, um, and close your ears, sellers, um, but you should probably hear this too. Because buyers pay a multiple of cash flow, um, and it's three to six times for most of the deals that are in the sort of five to, or three to $15 million price range that I spend most of my time in. Um, let's just say four. So because somebody's paying four times EBITDA, um, every dollar of profit that they communicate to you or are able to convince you of that isn't real profit, they don't get dollar for dollar to benefit, they get four times the benefit, five times the benefit. And when we're talking about millions of dollars, all of a sudden, a person has maybe the highest incentive, the seller has maybe the highest incentive in life to tell a story, I'll put it that way. And so buyer's duty is to take in 
a lot of data from nice reputable national sort of brokerages or um, sellers with high reputation and, and huge sort of positive impact on their community. And then also come into uh, realization that those facts as presented in glossy PDFs may not be accurate. So a huge part of diligence is actually picking apart financials, taxes, bank statements to understand what is the true cash flow of the business to apply the multiple to. And buyers get into a lot of issues with that. In terms of the dog chasing the car and then catching it, I think in the marketplace where I am, a lot of people are ready to be operators and aren't all that great at doing deals. Um, and so that kind of, it's, it's almost like um, you're a great NASCAR driver, but like uh, if you have to like put the tires on the thing first, like it's like this awkward sort of scenario where people have to do something not good at and then they can actually do what they're supposed to do. A lot of people um, ascribe to sort of being their own bosses, being a CEO. And so they're sort of gun the deal thing and then don't recognize there's a 10 year business operation on the end of it and even thinking about what that means. So you're spot on about sometimes people uh, being that dog that catches the car and then looks back and says, well, what do I do now? <laughs> well, you know, we, um, in our business, we obviously help clients with that process of, of putting in people process technology, but the, the whole reason you do that from our perspective is so you can alpha output, right? You got to have output to run your business on. You got to, you got to know what, what your numbers are. You got to follow them on a daily basis uh, mm -hmm. sometimes. Um, and so, that seems from our standpoint to be one of the keys to be a successful business owner and CEO. Is that consistent with what you see in the marketplace? I think so. I mean, I think it's mission critical to, to have a plan, to be ready to work it, to have contingencies. Um, and I mean, to your point about getting so many systems in place, a lot of times the glue that was sticking stuff together was the owner who's now going to be way less involved. And so without knowing you know, who's on first or sort of how are you going to manage the top, you know, three to five things you need to execute for this um, business to, to grow. You can be in a world of hurt because sometimes you've let knowledge walk out of the company that had you thought about it, you could have captured and you might have spent an extra couple of days with the seller to, to understand some things. And now that person may be enjoying their vacation a bit and they may be a bit harder to get on the phone. Not return those calls from the beach, I guess. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So um, I think we're about out of time for today, but Ellie, it's a great conversation. Um, any, any kind of final thoughts you want to put out there and also you know, give the viewers the opportunity to get in touch with you if they have further questions? Sure. So you can reach me at my website, guardiandodiligence.com, and that's do, D-U-E. You can also find me on LinkedIn, Elliot, E-L-L-I-O-T-T, -T, last name Holland, like the country. I'm responsive in both places, email, phone numbers are there. And last thing, just buyers, sometimes, sometimes people want to cut expenses and say, oh, it's a smaller deal. I'll just trust the seller and I can show you a graveyard full of people who thought smaller deals were less complex from a diligent perspective. So um, be, be prudent, um, be prudent buyers, be prudent. Awesome. Elliot, thanks again for being on the show. Great value. I'm sure our viewers can get a lot out of it. Um, and I hope they reach out to you with, with your questions. Um, so this is John Yeager. If you'd like to reach out, you can find me at john.yeager at btcpa.net or at 404-441-4835. See you next time on the next episode of Think Business.